Draper actually advocated for a return to a purer, more rational Christianity. Um, in, his early exam in his early lectures on chemistry to students at New York, for example, he sounds rather like a natural theologian. Draper spoke of the laws of nature as having been designed and set in place by an almighty God, the creator, the great architect. He actually uses that phrase. He refers to God as the great architect. And this more rational, reasonable Christianity comes from folks like Francis Bacon and the early members of the Royal Society of London. Later, you see the English deists advocate for a very similar position, in addition to folks like John Locke. Um, interestingly enough, all of them look back to the Protestant Reformation as a reformation not only of religion, but of science, or at the time it was called natural philosophy. Welcome to the Kirkwood Center podcast for Theology and Ethics. My name is Anthony Costello, and I am joined today by my colleague, Lenny Esposito, and Dr. James Ungurianu. James, I hope I'm saying that name correctly. Um, we have an excellent uh, uh, podcast for you today. This is going to be on church history. This is going to be on uh, a very... Uh, controversial topic or a topic that was made controversial maybe we might even say it that way in the 19th century uh we're going to be looking at the galileo affair as it's commonly known but we're before that we're going to talk a little bit more about uh what has come to be known as the conflict thesis between faith and science uh james unguriano is an expert in this field. He's written a couple books now on that. Um, and James, before I'm going to read a quote from the French sociologist Jacques Ellul to start us off. But before I read that, maybe just give us some personal biography. Uh, give us a little bit of your details of your educational background, uh, where you're at now, and uh, what sort of motivated you to look into this uh, history of the conflict thesis. Okay. Um... Okay, thank you guys for having me on. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, my academic background, um, <clears throat> well, I never really saw myself as a historian. Um, and uh, in my younger days, I, I, I was very artistic um, and I thought I was going to be, of all things, a comic book artist. My brother and I used to draw a lot of comic books when we were kids together. Um, but in high school, I started um, looking into AutoCAD software and I learned AutoCAD and out of high school, I started doing architectural drafting. So I was an architectural drafter for several years out of high school <clears throat> and I was taking um, night classes at a, a local college, started taking philosophy. I don't remember why I started taking philosophy at that time, but it was probably something to do with trying to find a little bit more meaning in, in my life. You know, I was doing well, working architectural drafting and uh, making a good living, but something felt like it was missing, I guess. So I started taking night classes in philosophy and religious studies at this college, and that kind of led me to discover the work of Paul Davies. Uh, Paul Davies is a British, British uh, theoretical physicist, and he wrote this book in, I believe, the late 19... 80s, God and the New Physics. And this book kind of introduced some of the early church fathers. Uh, he kind of integrated discussions with science and uh, St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas and kind of showed this kind of relationship between science and religion. And Davies' book kind of led me to the great books. I ended up finding a collection uh, free of Encyclopedia Britannica's great book series, started reading that, and they kind of introduced me to the Christian tradition, the church fathers, and um, led me to the Bible, and the Bible ultimately led me to Christ. Um, and at that point, I decided to quit architectural drafting and study philosophy and religion full-time. 
Uh, so it's kind of a, a story, a, a riches, riches to rags story. So I, I quit architecture and then I enrolled at University of California, Davis, to study philosophy and religion. And there um, I had a fantastic uh, supervisor, uh, honors thesis supervisor um, in the religious studies department, Alison Kuder. Alison Kuder is known for um, looking at sort of a more complex relationship between religion and science and I ended up writing a honors thesis on um, early church fathers and how they kind of appropriated Greek philosophy and Greek, Greek science. Uh, and then from there, I went to uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Um, I actually had the option of going either to Fuller or Trinity. And at that time, uh, Trinity had a very strong uh, history department. I went to Trinity, studied under uh, Scott Manich, John Woodbridge, um, had a great time at Trinity. And then after that, uh, uh, my wife and I decided to take a year off from, from school. Um, we ended up going to South Korea. Uh, I taught English in South Korea for about a year, but then coming back to the United States, I think this was back in 2013 or 2012, um, decided to look for a PhD program. Um, I wanted to work with Ron Numbers, who's well known for his work on the history of creationism, uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, but Ron at that point had just retired and he was no longer accepting PhD students. But he told me about the work of Peter Harrison. Now, I knew of Peter Harrison from my days at Trinity. I read a couple of his articles while I was studying at Trinity. Um, so after that recommendation from Ron, I ended up picking up the rest of his books and other articles that he's written. I thought I could really work well with Peter Harrison. Peter Harrison is a very well-known early modern historian who's done a lot of work, great work on the history of science and religion. I uh, ended up giving him a call. Uh, back in 2013, uh, Peter was the chair of a um, very important religious religion and science department at Oxford, but he stepped away from that position and he went back to Australia, where he's originally from, the University of Queensland. Um, he told me that he was leading a new uh, research center there and asked me to apply. I did, got a scholarship. And um, for four years, I studied under him at the University of Queensland. And I, my, my book, my first book, is actually kind of a revised version of uh, my dissertation that I did under him. Uh, currently, I am at uh, Stony Brook School. It's a fantastic little uh, uh, college prep school on Long Island in New York. Um, and they, I'm very grateful that uh, they have me here. They have They've given me a lot of freedom uh, when it comes to what I can teach. I'm currently teaching uh, two, uh, two or more classes, um, one on introduction to world religions and then kind of an intro to uh, philosophy class. And uh, hopefully, uh, maybe in the next year, we'll have uh, a program set up for a class on science and religion. So um, this is where I am right now in New York. I never really thought myself uh, living in New York, New York. But <laughs> I'm originally I'm originally from California, but uh, we had to travel clear across the country. Uh, well, find, your studies have taken <laughs> you to uh, to several places. That's quite a, a sort of academic uh, journey. Uh, so spiritual is one. I would I would say my my, my, whole, my spiritual experience yeah. kind of aligned more or less with my own academic pursuits and interests. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. What an awesome story and. Uh, yeah, well, that's exciting. So you're teaching, I mean, the, the prep school is high school level age then? Yeah, it's uh, my, I teach a, a senior uh, capstone class is kind of the, the, the you know, you all the seniors here have to take this class in order to, to graduate. But it's it kind of taking everything they've learned the past few years uh, at Stony Brook, which is kind of a classical uh, Christian type of school, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of integrating that in discussions of uh, different world religions, different religious traditions and, and philosophy. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, we're going to be doing another podcast on classical education yeah. with another colleague from Talbot. And that's awesome. one of the necessary components to uh, revive the culture here is yeah. the classical returning to the classical <clears throat> education. So I'm thrilled to hear that you're doing that and you have a, a nice job there um, working with those young minds. Um, so before we get into your historical research, 
on this question of the conflict thesis. I want to open up this section with a uh, a, a longer quote, but I, I think it's worth reading the whole thing by Jacques Ellul, mm. the French sociologist, who I'm sure I know you're familiar with. Um, and this kind of sets up, I think, he, he just puts it so well, this problem of historical narratives as they relate to the church. So I'll read, I'm reading here from the Subversion of Christianity, which I think he published in, oh, maybe the 80s, um, 1986. And Elul says about history, we have to avoid two errors. The first is that of rejecting all the church's past, of scorning and condemning all it has done, of saying categorically, as is unceasingly said today, in an abominable fashion, that the church means obscurantism. On this view, Judeo-Christian thinking is the cause or origin of every modern evil, of state absolutism, of capitalist alienation, of universal deception and hypocrisy, of Oedipus complexes or guilt, of the subordination of women, of the enslaving of the third world, of the spoliation of nature. The medieval church, which we're going to talk about, is the Inquisition, serfdom, the Crusades, theocracy, the forced construction of cathedrals by a brutalized and terrorized people. A little later, it is Galileo, the origin of capitalism, the invasion and subjugation of the whole world, the destruction of original native cultures, the crushing of people under Christian dogma and morality. All evils derive from the Judeo-Christian faith. And alongside these fierce and simplistic accusations, we find a glorification of the pure and cheerful pagan, of a human liberal polytheism, of a spiritual infancy that Christianity has supposedly rendered abortive. There is a little truth in all this, a mm. very little, as regards Christendom, but it needs exact historical examination, end quote. So, James, you've done the historical examination in your last two books on this problem that I think Elul describes there of this idea that all evils can simply be attributed to the history of, of the church in Christendom. So your latest book uh, of Popes and Unicorns, which we'll link to, Science, Christianity, How the Conflict Thesis Fooled the World. Give us, give us the gist of what you're doing in that book with, with your co-author, by the way, I should mention David, David Hutchings. Yeah, David's great. Um, uh, it's interesting that he said there's a little bit of truth in, in all of it. I thought, I thought that a was very little. Really yeah. <laughs> so the, the whole idea that there's, there's a conflict between religion and science. So the, the idea in a nutshell, and you guys can stop me anytime and, and ask questions and you could, because I, I tend to kind of just go go on and on if, if, if you let me. So the idea of conflict is an idea that science and religion are fundamentally at odds or fundamentally in conflict, always have been and always will be. And now this is kind of a history of war. The idea is kind of a history of war. So in that sense, it is a very much a historical argument. It's an argument allegedly drawn from history. Uh, most proponents of the conflict thesis maintain if you look back in history, particularly Christian history, but not exclusively Christian history, if you look back in history at every moment, every step, every advance of science or some new learning, religion has always attempted to oppose progress. Um, you have notions like Christianity was responsible for the demise of ancient Greek science, uh, that the medieval period was an age of intellectual darkness, that Galileo was in prison and tortured for advancing Copernicanism, uh, or that Christian theologians opposed uh, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, and so on and so on. The list is really kind of endless. So the, the question of who developed uh, this idea, this thesis, is kind of a tricky question, and it's really what I'm trying to do in, in my own work. Uh, a little bit of background, like uh, his historiographical background. Uh, most historians of science and religion, though, have kind of turned this narrative, this thesis on its head. And they have been rejecting this kind of simplistic view for about a century now. 
um, a key figure in this kind of reevaluation, re interestingly enough, was philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, back in the 1920s, he, he warned readers that conflict, even though conflict uh, between science and religion is what naturally occurs to the mind, and again, this is back in the 1920s, uh, he said that the true facts of the case are very much more complex. Yeah, I, I actually have a quote from Whitehead. He says, in the first place, there could be no living science and there's, unless there's a widespread instinctive conviction in the existence of an order of things, yeah, in particular, an order of nature. This inexpungible belief that every detailed occurrence can be correlated with its antecedents in a perfectly definite manner must come from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. Yeah, Whitehead observed that the very foundation of modern science was laid in the soil of medieval religious thought. And um, after he made this, this claim, you have many people who kind of, other scholars who started supporting it in the following decade. So you see this rather, you, there's, there's, this, there's this turn in the scholarship where people are now seeing religion uh, no longer as oppressive or obstructionist. Scholars are beginning to view it as an important, if not essential element and development of modern science. And you have thinkers like Robert K. Merton, Michael B. Foster, Richard Westfall, Charles Webster, and so on, who saw in particular a connection between the rise of modern science and Protestantism, the religion of Protestantism. So by the mid 1970s, uh, another major historical graphical shift occurred within the scholarship, within the field. It became clear that notions of conflict were now mostly confined to the 19th century. So all this, this, this discussion, this debate that uh, the medieval period was a period of intellectual darkness by the 1970s, no one, no legitimate historian believed that idea anymore. But they, they, they still held that something happened in the 19th century where there was a conflict between religion and science. And typically, it was between the, the, the controversies that broke out between uh, the fields of geology and biology, and specifically the religious responses to Charles Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859. But even, even here, things are not so simple. Um, there's a wonderful quote by church historian Owen Chadwick. He noted a distinction between, quote, between science when it was against religion and scientists when they were against religion. And by the end of the 1970s, the, the distinctions were being made, this distinction was being made by a host of scholars, especially important, I want to mention here, is a book by James R. Moore. He published a book entitled uh, Post-Darwinian Controversies in 1979, and Moore demonstrated this kind of very complex, the complexity of religious responses to Darwin's work. You have uh, what kind of been neglected until that point, uh, a host of thinkers in the 19th century, religious thinkers in the 19th century who came into the, to aid Darwin. Uh, and Moore's book made a huge impact in the field uh, for later historians. So this notion of a complex relationship between religion and science became almost sort of a, a clarion call for subsequent uh, historians of science in, in the 20th century. Uh, the key work here, and again, I wanna mention this, the key work here is historian of science, John Headley Brook, uh, who is a wonderful man. I've, I've, I've met him several times and corresponded several times, uh, but he could sort of consolidated almost a century worth of scholarship in his magisterial science and religion, some historical perspectives, and he published this in 1991. And he concluded that serious scholarship in the history of science uh, has revealed so extraordinary, rich, and complex relationship between science and religion uh, in, in the past that general theses of any kind are very difficult to sustain. So at its most, most elementary level, uh, positions of either conflict or concord between science and religion, Brooks says, are undermined by the abundance of historical evidence that kind of precludes any kind of complete or meta description of how the two interacted. So what, what he's calling for is looking at 
the these these alleged conflicts between science and religion at a case by case situation. Got to localize it. Mm -hmm. Look at particular personalities, particular historical events, uh, political, religious, theological, and you'll see that it's always been a very complicated relationship. Right. right. So, so that, 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 go ahead, Lenny. Can, can we do this a little bit? Because I I, I want to even go back a little bit pre-Darwin. Mm. Uh, in Meyer's book, Signature of the Cell, he points to the urea incident, to Frederick Waller, uh, who was uh, in, a chemist. Um, and he was, in 1828, he's mixing ammonium uh, cy cyanide, uh, mm. trying to create cyanide. Uh, but he formed crystals and it turns out that these crystals weren't <laughs> weren't cyanide uh he sub he actually synthesized urea now urea is the primary component of urine why that's a big deal is because there was another group out there called the vitalists mm -hmm. and and, and the, the vitality life they held that only living organisms can produce the stuff of life all mm -hmm. the chemicals that life is and the story goes that there was a backlash once Wohler was able to synthesize urea that they felt there was an affront against their research because people weren't even delving into these aspects of living versus non-living organisms. Mm. And and uh, a group of them started to say, we're never going to let religion limit us again. Now, that's interesting. Can you comment? Uh, we're, that's a that's a good case. That's even pre Darwin. So. Can you comment on that and, and give me your point of view? Uh, I don't know too many details of that, that particular event, but, um, and this is just kind of lends to what, what Brooke is saying that at every, every event where there seems to be some kind of uh, tension between a religious group or a group that are practicing scientists, there's, there's always something, something kind of between the lines. So the, the religious response, the alleged religious response to, to this, this particular event, I think if we look at it in more detail, you'll see that it's not so much uh, science versus religion, but uh, it's, it's it's an issue of kind of contending worldviews or contending. Yeah, I don't I don't know that the vitalists were necessarily even the majority of Christian believers at that point in time. There was just a subgroup, but it's easy to label them as. And and then of course T. H. Huxley. Yeah you know, yeah. starts to really leverage these things for political purposes, for, for promotion, yeah. for marketing. Um, but, but it's, yeah, it's easy to, it's easy to paint people that way. Yeah. Let, let's springboard then from Huxley, since you mentioned him to uh, yeah. these two American figures that James has written about uh, Andrew Dixon White. And is it John Draper? Was his John partner, John William Draper, yeah. John Draper, partner in crime. Yeah. Who uh did they did they start Cornell University or was it was was Dixon just the first president of Cornell? Yeah. Let, so let's go into that, their their sure. ideas of the conflict thesis and also what they did. Like what were they? Yeah. Um, so just a little bit of background about Draper and White. Um, so when this new kind of more complex understanding of science and religion relations emerged in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, most historians during that time trace the origins of the conflict thesis to the 19th century, to these Amer Anglo-American writers, John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White. So Draper and White are big figures in historical studies of science and religion. Almost every single scholar uh, mentions them at some point in, in their publication. Um, let me begin with Draper, because he uh, was older and he published before White. Uh, Draper was actually born in England. His father was, uh, interestingly enough, uh, an itinerant uh, Wesleyan minister. There's actually an interesting story uh, behind uh, Draper's uh, father's vocation. Uh, Draper's dad was raised Catholic, and during a local revival meeting, he and some of his friends in, intended to, to go to the revival meeting and uh, mock the revivalists. Uh, but by the end of the meeting, Draper's dad had converted to Methodism. Um, and that kind of started his, his whole ministry. So at age 11, Draper's dad sent him to a Methodist boarding school, presumably kind of following his father's footsteps and kind of preparing him for the ministry. Um, 
his father seems to have had a very strong and nonconformist outlook. So even though he was a, a, a minister, he also had sort of a penchant for scientific subjects like chemistry and astronomy. Uh, so it's no surprise that his father sent the young Draper to study chemistry and medicine at University of College London, known back then as London University, which unlike Oxford and Cambridge at that time, did not require any kind of religious tests. Um, so, but tragically, uh, his father died almost as soon as Draper started his studies. Um, but Draper being something a kind of very determined young man completed his degree and then afterwards got married and then emigrated to the United States. He had some family living in a colony in Virginia at that time. Uh, Draper established himself very quickly as a leading scientist. Uh, he taught at a couple different schools before becoming head of chemistry at New York University in 1937. Uh, he was known as a pioneer of photochemistry and is thought to be the first person to take a photograph of a human face. Uh, he was also one of the earliest to practice what's called astrophotography. There's still in the archives a picture of, that he took of the moon. So um, his, his, his chemical, his chemistry was, was, was top notch. Uh, but D Draper gave up chemistry and science soon after, after a kind of successful career uh, at New York, and he turned to history. Um, most well known, Draper's most well known for uh, his book, History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science, and that was published in 1874. Draper claimed in this book that the history of science was a narrative of the conflict of two contending powers, the expansive force of the human intellect on the one side and the compression arising from traditionary faith and human interest on the other. Uh, so he's mostly known for that. And I'll talk a little bit about how Draper's view is a little bit more complicated than what most scholars say. Uh, Andrew Dixon White was never a scientist. He was actually a man of literature. White was born in New York right around the time Draper and his family were making their way to America from England. Uh, White's parents also believed that White was destined for the pulpit. Uh, White's father sent him to an Episcopalian college, um, but White uh, found the curriculum at that school uh, really uninspired. He actually ran away from home. He actually ran away and demanded to be sent to Yale College. Uh, he had something about falling out with his father about this. But ultimately, his father relented and sent him to study Yale, uh, to go to Yale to study history and English literature. Um, after college, White went on this kind of grand three-year European tour, visiting places like Oxford and Cambridge, studying in France and Berlin, uh, spent several months backpacking, exploring Switzerland, Austria, Italy, uh, before coming back to do postgraduate work at Yale. Uh, 18, in 1857, at the remarkable age of 25, uh, White was appointed history professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, but at the outbreak of the Civil War, he resigned his post and was unexpectedly nominated and elected for New York State Senate. So he moved to New York, uh, and it was during this time that White met Ezra Cornell. Uh, Cornell was a Quaker who had made a fortune in the telegraph business, and together they put their minds together and founded Cornell University uh, in New York. White became its first president, but he was sort of an absentee president. Um, he had a number of other diplomatic appointments, uh, and he eventually re resigned the presidency in 1885 to work exclusively on, on research and writing. But before all that, White was known for his battlefields of science. There was a lecture that he gave in 1869 in which he traced the kind of what he called the great sacred struggle for the liberty of science. So he's reviewing one by one the battles fought in astronomy and chemistry, anatomy and geology. And he took this lecture, expanded it into a book uh, in 1876 entitled simply The Warfare of Science. Then after resigning from Cornell, he spent the next couple of decades expanding this, this, this narrative even further and eventually turned into his two volume masterpiece, a history of the warfare of science with theology and Christendom that was published in 1896. So according to historians of science, Draper and White kind of set the terms of the debate 
although few people cite them today, most who claim there's some kind of conflict, some sort of conflict between science and religion, usually follow one or more of the narratives set out in their respective work. So again, big consequence, uh, very important figures in the discussion of science and religion. Yeah, they really, so, um, so I'm sure there were others, right, sure. who yeah. were developing some kind of conflict thesis, but at least in America, but, but okay, their, their books, their, mm -hmm um version of the conflict thesis is really what began would say began to impact the academy in america but but also overseas right i mean was this a global impact that this that there yeah. had more than just uh in the states right yeah draper in particular um uh, had uh, a more international presence than than white uh draper was involved with uh Edward Humans, who was a well-known uh, editor and publisher for Appleton and Co. And Humans was uh, kind of a leading figure when it came to international copyright laws uh, for books. And he, uh, he set up a series, international scientific series in the late, 19, late 1870s. Uh, and Draper's book was part of it, which was kind of an international affair. So his i his 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 narrative became very popular uh in in european countries it was translated his book was translated into something like 10 different languages it's incredible um where white had more of an impact here uh, uh in the us um because i lived i lived in in germany austria and italy for hmm. several years and you know you you the, it, uh, you know this is in the early 2000s late 90s early 2000s you know, and yeah, the assumption is that, you know, these two spheres of human existence are simply incompatible at, at, the, at the, for the average person. That's kind of the average person's sort of thing is that. Yeah, it's, it's it is. part of our kind of modern understanding yeah. of who we are. They just, yeah. people, you, you walk to a person on, just an average person on the street and you ask them, what's the relationship between religion and science? And most would say, oh, they're in conflict. You know, right. and, and, and they don't even realize where they're getting that narrative, where they're getting that story. But mo if, you, you, if you can trace it, most historians believe it, it kind of traces down to Draper and White. Right. Were, were, were Draper and White materialists or do they are they did they least identify as agnostic or anything of that nature? Yeah. Excellent question. I think this, I think this is regarding like what were there maybe philosophical presuppositions uh, right. what they actually what believe assumptions. um most scholars have argued that draper was anti-catholic at least he was anti-classic and no doubt uh the catholic church faces the harshest criticism on his narrative uh at the same time i think accusing draper of anti-catholicism doesn't really tell us much uh, most 19th century thinkers uh uh were anti-Catholic. Anti-Catholic sentiment was uh, just absolutely pervasive in mid 19th century, late 19th century, particularly in America. Okay. Um, I, now I'm not arguing against what earlier evaluations have, what, what Brooke and Moore have argued. I think their, their work, what, what they've done in their respective books uh, are, have a place and, and I think everybody should read it. Um, but I, I, what I'm arguing in my book is that this, even the story of Draper and White themselves, it's, it's a bit more complicated, and 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 hopefully it, it kind of it, it fills a gap, kind of this gap I see in scholarship about Draper and White. So what I what I argue in my books uh, is that Draper actually advocated for a return to a purer, more rational Christianity. Um, in his early exam, in his early lectures on chemistry to students at New York, for example, he sounds rather like a natural theologian. Draper spoke of the laws of nature as having been designed and set in place by an almighty God, the creator, the great architect. He actually uses that phrase. He refers to God as the great architect. And this more rational, reasonable Christianity comes from folks like Francis Bacon and the early members of the Royal Society of London. Later, you see the English deists advocate for a very similar position, in addition to folks like John Locke. Um, interestingly enough, 
all of them look back to the Protestant Reformation as a reformation not only of religion, but of science, or at the time it was called natural philosophy. Yeah. Draper seemed to uh, depend uh, on historians like Edward Gibbon and his history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Um, but he also mentions the work of German Lutheran uh, historians like Johann von Mosham, um, English clergyman, Kanye Middleton, uh, William Warburton, John Dorton, and, 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 and others. And he was greatly influenced by the writings of a uh, conservative liberal uh, French historian, François Gozo, uh, who wrote these massive treatises on the history of European civilization, really breathtaking in scope. Gozo believed that continuous, kind of this continuous struggle between different forces, ideas, principles, had actually contributed to the steady progress of modern Europe. Uh, here, we could also mention the influence of John Stuart Mill, uh, who was also influenced by Guzzo. And I should say that Mill was likely a classmate of Draper at London University. Um, there is some kind of archival uh, evidence that Mill, uh, Mill and Draper shared the same classroom. Um, crucial, crucial to Guzzo's uh, idea is that he insisted that the Protestant Reformation was the beginning of an intellectual movement that led to the Enlightenment. Um, and looking at the entire corpus of Draper's writing is also important here because uh, it's, it's often mentioned but left unanalyzed by historians that Draper's History of the Conflict, again, History of Conflict was published in 1874. Uh, his History of Conflict was largely a condensed version of previously published works. Uh, most importantly, Draper had published in uh, 1863, A History of the Intellectual Development of Europe, which obviously has some influence from Guzzo. Um, uh, and that was about a decade before he published his History, his history of Conflict. Um, and he made, in this book, he made a very important distinction that most historians have, have forgotten or have, have ignored for whatever reason. Um, so in this book, Draper is discussing the so-called paganization of Christianity under Emperor Constantine. Uh, and in this discussion, Draper distinguished between Christianity and what he called ecclesiastical organizations. And he says that the former Christianity is a gift of God. Okay, Christianity is a gift of God, Draper says. And the latter are the product of human invention, yeah, right, and therefore open to criticism or condemnation. I mean, that's a very common theme in the 19th century. Even oh, yeah. Tolstoy has basically the same uh, ideas. If you read in uh, his Gospel in Brief, I don't know exactly when Tolstoy wrote that. If it was before or after his novels, but you know, he had this. Is this? It's the same idea that mm -hmm. you have to return to. Um, a pure, not even where um, like maybe Paul is wrong. You got to get back to the the original Jesus because Paul yeah, is all sort yeah. of a traditional <laughs> overlay that has gone astray. So it kind of gives rise to sort of the uh, you know what we call like later liberal Protestantism of the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, where you have to you have to unfilter you know, get to unfiltered Christianity because, you know, and right. wade your way through all these layers of later tradition, um, which, you know, I mean, okay, you could say, yes, in some sense, the Protestant Reformation was the cause right. of that. But if you take that too far, as Tolstoy and Otten Draper does, then, you know, you get your own sort of private Jesus because you're the one who has the the, the the lens to what what who Jesus really was and what yeah. it is. You get more it, 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 yeah it's interesting it's like that Jesus that that kind of spurred the primitive church movement in the early 19th century and of course out of that also you get a whole lot of cults there's a reason why the the lds called themselves the latter day saints restoring the gospel restoration, and, and restorationism yeah all of that yeah. falls from that same fruit yeah so, so that's so draper I, right so this is draper yeah, yeah. yeah so what i end up doing in, yeah. in, in in my in my book when it, specifically when it regards to draper there's like two crucial points understanding Draper's background, his presuppositions. Uh, first is that Draper's understanding of history 
is mostly taken from Protestant historians, okay? Mm -hmm. So his understanding of the history of Christianity is drawn from this Protestant narrative. And second is that these Protestant historians obviously predate the 19th century. Um, ultimately, it seems like Draper's hero was Unitarian minister and chemist Joseph Priestley. Uh, in one of his early lectures to students, for example, he tells students that, quote, we must not impute it, impute it to mental weakness that Priestley passed through so many different religious beliefs before arriving to Unitarianism but rather to the pursuit of truth, end quote. So clearly, so clearly Draper was no atheist. He, he looked back to what was this idea of rational religion, rational Christianity found among 17th and 18th century intellectuals who viewed this kind of new knowledge as evidence of the creative power of God. So in, in, in that sense, Draper can be firmly placed in what you said earlier, Anthony, this kind of liberal Protestant tradition. Mm -hmm. Now, Andrew Dixon White was in the same Protestant stream as Draper, uh, but in a different segment, different course, if you will. Now, White did not look to the past, but he rather to contemporary reconceptualization of what religion was. Uh, religion is found, White believed, in moral conscience, intuition, in sentiment. So this definition of religion, of course, is not new, right? It exemplified elements of a kind of a romantic movement, which became, by the late 19th century, kind of a central component. More like Schleiermacher. Yeah, Schleiermacher exactly. Take. And Schleiermacher was responding to the German pantheists, the German, German romantics like Schlegels and, and Goethe. So uh, maybe... Right. Yeah, and, and in fact, while in Germany, remember that White had yeah, this, right. he was time in Germany, in Germany White yeah. studied under the great liberal Protestant thinkers, Karl Ritter, Leopold mm -hmm. von Ranke, and he was also reading folks like Gotthold Lessing, uh, Johann Goether, uh, yeah. Frederick Schellemacher, uh, what scholars now today call mediating German theologians. And these mediating theology was this kind of the attempt to reconcile Christianity with modernity. Uh, Lessing, for example, talked about the evolution of religion. He maintained that all faiths would one day lead to one truth. Uh, so no creed, no dogma was complete or final for Lessing. Christianity was this ever-evolving thing, just like the rest of civilization. And White had imbued this idea. It became part of his own worldview. Mm. Yeah. Schellmacher, moreover, convinced, that, yeah. Yeah, convinced him that uh, religion is not found in doctrine or books or dogma, but in intuition, feeling, this kind of inward witness of the heart. So Draper and White were flowing the, down the same liberal Protestant stream, but just in different areas. And if I could like, uh, can put it in, in, in very briefly, is that Draper followed a religion that was more focused on the head, whereas yeah. White obeyed a religion of, of the heart. That's, you know, that's good. So that gives us, so we wouldn't, we would, to be fair to history, we wouldn't want to ascribe just some kind of scientific atheistic materialism these guys are not like the logical positivists of the 1940s or 50s yeah, yeah. more sort of the in the straight of the sort of the deistic the the hyper rational uh god for for why of you know and but where and then religion in this evolution everything's look being looked at through an evolutionary framework whether it be because yeah. of Hegel or because of darwin later um you know, and then having to divest, if anything, divest the Christian faith from these accrued, superstitious kind of right. um, beliefs, especially those of, of the Catholic Church, which maybe then uh, that is a good, because there seems to be a direct conflict there with uh, Catholicism, especially. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's go ahead then and move into this concrete uh, example that I'm, I'm assuming they used of uh, the Galileo uh, affair, right? Uh, that this would make a paradigm example of what maybe they were trying to show. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. They, they both mention Galileo and they both offer a very uh, simplistic kind of a rudimentary understanding uh, of the affair. Uh, but again, 
uh, they were not the only ones. A, a, a lot of thinkers and scholars were using the Galileo affair uh, to not just beat up on the Roman Catholic Church, but also to beat up on, on Protestants that they, they viewed as too conservative, uh, too literal. Um, so the Galileo affair, and right in 1633, the Roman Inquisition found Galileo guilty of vehement suspicion of heresy, right? He had committed a specifically religious crime for the Inquisition. He, he had defended Copernicus uh, in, in a book. Uh, the book in question is Galileo's Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems, which was published in 1632. Um, Galileo had to recite an abjuration of his erroneous beliefs. Uh, the dialogue was banned, and he was condemned to house arrest until the end of his life, so about, about nine years. Uh, as traditionally interpreted, Galileo's trial epitomizes the conflict between science and religion, right? It has become this paradigmatic, iconic case of conflict for many, many, um, not just uh, popular understandings, but scholars as well. Scholars continue, um, uh, very intelligent scholars continue to use the Galileo Affair as, as an example of conflict between religion and science. Uh, but what is ignored uh, in these kind of more simplistic narratives of, uh, of the event is that the condemnation of Galileo was sort of the climax of a series of events starting uh, as in 15, 1543, maybe even further back, uh, when Copernicus published his on the revolutions of the he heavenly spheres. Now, Copernicus advanced, advanced an argument that the earth, right, moves around the sun. Now, Copernicus, Copernicus's argument at the time was, to be frank, inconclusive, okay? The idea faced many powerful objections. First, the, the Earth's motion seemed epistemologically absurd, right? Because it contradicted direct sense experience, right? It doesn't feel, it doesn't, I don't see the Earth moving in that way, and particularly at that time, right? Uh, secondly, it seemed empirically false because it had astro astronomical consequences that were not observed, that weren't taken into account with the kind of technology they had at the time. Third, uh, it seemed mechanically impossible because it can contradicted the available understanding of verbal laws of motion um, and the clearest observation of moving bodies. And finally, it did seem religiously heretical in some sense because it contradicted certain biblical texts such as uh, Joshua chapter 10, right? Where God stopped the sun to prolong daylight. And this is, this is a, a common thing. And all these things um, are often mentioned when, when scholars talk about the Galileo affair. Um, and these objections were advanced at that time by astronomers, natural, philosophy, natural philosophers, as well as theologians and, and, and churchmen by Protestants as well as Catholics. So in short, Copernicanism attracted very few followers at that time. Galileo himself in the first 20 years of his career was not a Copernican. Uh, his main research focus was physics, not astronomy. He was, he was aware of the considerable evidence against Copernicanism. Again, sense experience, astronomical observation, traditional physics, scriptural passages. He knew all about this, and he was not a Copernican. He did not follow Copernicus. However, in 1609, Galileo heard a story about a new device that had been built in the Netherlands uh, called a telescope. And Galileo quickly figured out how to build his own. He gave the design to the Duke of Vena, uh, Venice, uh, who was so impressed by Galileo's uh, uh, invention, or his idea at least, that he saw a, a lot of potential military applications in the telescope. He gave Galileo this kind of university appointment for life. So Galileo then used his telescope to begin looking at the skies. And Galileo quickly made several incredible discoveries with this new technology. And he published this in his Starry Messenger uh, in 1610, almost immediately. So he observed first uh, that the moon surface is rough. It's full of mountains. It's full of valleys. 
Uh, he saw that the Milky Way is a dense collection of individual stars. Uh, he saw that the planet Jupiter has four moons revolving around it. He discovered the phases of Venus and sunspots. And again, he published this uh, uh, soon afterwards in, in his book on sunspots in 1613. So these new telescopic evidence removed for Galileo most observational astronomical objections to Copernicanism. Okay, so he, his final assessment is that the arguments for the Earth's motion at this point were collectively stronger than those for the Earth's rust based on this new technology. Uh, Galileo attempted to give a demonstration of a telescope at uh, the University of uh, Padua, uh, just kind of east of Venice, kind of showing off these discoveries, but there were two professors uh, at the demonstration that refused to look through the telescope. Now, uh, were they Catholic? Uh, were they Catholic priests? They were not Catholic priests. Were they bishops? No, they were not bishops. Were they even theologians? No. In fact, they, these professors that refused to look through teles, uh, uh, Galileo's telescope were actually secular professors of philosophy. And by secular, I mean simply they had no particular religious authority. They, they were Christian, no doubt, but they had no ecclesiastical duty or, or power. So the question then becomes, why why did these philosophy professors refuse to look through the telescope? Um, no doubt there were probably some kind of personal rivalry or jealousy going on. Um, but I think in order to understand why this, these, these discoveries were, were um, resisted by many uh, at the time, it's kind of the intellectual background of how Catholic Christians understood the solar system and Galileo's time. Uh, Catholic scholarship in this area was dominated by the thought of Thomas Aquinas, uh, uh, who lived and died in the 13th century. And Aquinas's main contribution uh, to this discussion was kind of connecting Christianity with the work of a Greek philosopher, Aristotle, right, who was very popular, not just in, in Christianity at that time, but also among Muslim theologians and philosophers as well. So one of the philosophers who refused to look through Galileo's telescope was, in fact, a professor of Aristotelian philosophy at the university. Now, Aristotle and many ancient thinkers had a what's called a geocentric view of the solar system. Right? This meant that the Earth was at the center with the sun, moon, and other planets orbiting us. Uh, but they also had a very different view of what those celestial bodies were. Right? They thought that the sun, the moon, the planets were not material things at all, really. They were more like philosophical abstractions that existed kind of just in this realm of perfect beings. Uh, they, 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 they were, these philosophers believed, these perfect spheres, and they moved in these perfect mathematically predictable circular movements. So Galileo's discoveries with his telescope sharply contradicted this view of the cosmos. Um, so that is the philosophical context of the Galileo affair. Uh, let's kind of consider now the kind of more religious and political background, because those things are also very important. Uh, most obviously, uh, in 1517, right, uh, a Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther challenged the teachings of the Catholic Church, and this triggered the events that we now call the Protestant Reformation, right? Most of Europe up to this time was affiliated with the Catholic Church, but after the Reformation, several areas veered away from Catholicism and adopted various forms of Protestantism, uh, and this it was a terrible shock for Europe. Uh, the other shock was the discovery of the New World, but this in particular was a huge shock for uh, Europe. Not only that, the Reformation led to a number of extremely violent wars, uh, which continued for centuries. Uh, from 1618 to 1648, uh, you have the Thirty Years' War, right? It drew a number of different political factions, often, though not always, uh, divided on religious lines. Uh, this war killed as much as one third of the population of the German states. Imagine a war today that killed one third of the population of a country. That would be something like today, 100 million people in the United States. So huge, huge war, bloody, terrible. And these kind of theological and religious questions were not abstractions at this time, right? They had real political consequences and often very violent ones, okay? So Galileo was trying to get into this conversation at a very religiously volatile 
moment in history. Um, political background, uh, the Italian peninsula in Galileo's time was not Italy, right? It was sort of a collection of different states. Uh, this included the papal states. The papal states were ruled by the Pope just as a monarch would rule their domain. You know, passing laws, uh, collecting taxes, uh, mobilizing armies, invading territories, and so on. And this kind of seems strange to us now, but during that time, uh, it was very much understood that the Catholic Church was both a church and a state. Um, and even when they weren't physically fighting, these states, these papal states, were in constant struggle for influence and control using alliances, diplomacy, espionage, economic power to advance each particular uh, state's interests. So what all this kind of underlines is that the Galileo affair, the Galileo himself was playing uh, a game, you know, a high stakes game. He was gambling, kind of gambling with his life in some way. Maybe he didn't even realize it at the time. Uh, he knew that, uh, he knew this, he knew this though, and he kind of made alliances. Uh, he came up with his own strategies and tactics. Uh, his patrons in, in the Grand Duchy of Tuscany was this kind of ruthless banking Medici family, right? And that kind of opened the doors for his career. So it kind of repaid their help by naming the moons of Jupiter after the Medici family. Um, at any rate, soon after the publication of these telescopic discoveries, a formal complaint was lodged against Galileo. And again, this is like 1615. And the Inquisition began an investigation. Uh, Galileo responded to these criticisms, this complaint by venting in these kind of uh, long form private letters. Uh, one in particular that became very famous is that his appeal directly to the Grand Duchess Christina um, in, 15, in 1615, uh, which, by the way, this letter, uh, we, we've all could probably come across this letter, but he actually never sent this letter. He knew it would get him into trouble, so he actually never sent this letter to Christina, but somehow it got into the hands of the Inquisition, and all these private letters of Galileo uh, made it into the hands of his enemy somehow, which is just kind of a remarkable thing. So in these letters, Galileo kind of wrapped himself in piety, insisting that he was not doing anything that violated Catholic teachings, even citing earlier Catholic thinkers like St. Augustine to defend his, his position. He maintained that he was the true uh, Catholic and that his enemies were trying to warp the intellectual history of the church. Uh, he quoted a very famous cardinal who said that the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how uh, one goes to heaven, not how the heavens go. So he's trying to give this kind of aurora, uh, this kind of uh, uh, this personality that he is the more pious one in this debate. Uh, so Galileo was playing a game, but his opponents, his enemies, were also playing a game, and they were they were better at it than than he was. Uh, in 1615, although he was not summoned to Rome. He decided to go to Rome anyway, kind of to defend himself in, at the Inquisition. Uh, Gal Galileo felt that he could teach the church a thing or two, not only about the natural world, but about the Bible and theology as well. Uh, he was, and some scholars believe that he was just kind of a hopelessly tactless individual. He had, he had no tact. He, he was very arrogant. He was very condescending. And he believed he was a genius. Uh, one supporter wrote that he had more love for Galileo than Galileo has love for him. And the supporter, in, in, in fact, actually became his adversary after this visit to Rome. He writing, uh, quote, Galileo has ruined himself by being so much in love with his own genius and by having no respect for others. One should not wonder that everybody conspires to damn him, end quote. Church officials were very patient with Galileo, to say the least. Uh, nothing actually came of this event uh, except for a warning. So the following year, a decree was issued by the Congregation of the Index declaring that uh, the doctrine of the Earth's movement is scientifically false and theologically contrary to scripture. Uh, philosophers disturbed by Galileo's ideas formed an alliance with some powerful priests they were determined to kind of bring him down. So we, here we see kind of rivalries going on. Uh, they managed to persuade the Medici family that Galileo was toxic, and he kind of was toxic, and Galileo became a political liability 
So they kind of withdrew their protection of Galileo. The index, though, never mentions Galileo. There was actually another book that was published at the time that also argued that the Earth's motion was probably true and that uh, it was compatible with scripture. That book was condemned and banned. But again, Galileo's work wasn't. And this is probably because, despite his personality flaws, uh, he had good standing among certain Catholic officials. Many of them had been his admirers, supporters, and friends. Um, he did receive, as I mentioned a moment ago, a private admonition. Okay, There are actually two versions of this admonition. Both seem somewhat contradictory. Um, the first one, he was told by a friend, a high-ranking cardinal, Robert uh, Bellarmine, that he could discuss heliocentrism as long as he did not defend it. Okay, but there's another admonition coming from the church, kind of a more official document, saying that he could not talk about Copernicanism at all in any context. So the fact that there are two documents kind of led to what happened next. For the se next several years, Galileo followed the advice of Bellarmine and pretended he had no knowledge of this kind of special injunction by the Inquisition to not talk about Copernicanism and Copernicanism as all, at all. But then a new opportunity arose for Galileo in 1623. Galileo, one of Galileo's great admirers, Cardinal Maffio Barberini, uh, became Pope, Pope Urban VIII. So Galileo gets this impression that if he exercised caution, he could publish a book about the Earth's motion. So then about a decade later, this book comes out, and this is a dialogue of the two chief world systems, which is kind of the stage conversation between the defender of Copernicanism and the defender of geocentrism. And Galileo believed that this kind of dialogue format uh, would uh, uh, kind of demonstrate that he was complying uh, with better means warning. This is a gamble that Galileo had, that his kind of friendly church of relations would not blame him for this type of discussion. Uh, but the church saw things differently. Uh, Galileo had badly misfired. Uh, that same year, the special injunction that Galileo completely ignored resurfaced, uh, and he was officially summoned to Rome this time in 1633. And despite his old age and ill health, he was put on trial in order to explain himself. Galileo brought documents. He had this letter from his cardinal friend saying that he could, he would be allowed to talk about uh, Copernicanism as long as he didn't defend it. Uh, but however, during the trial, he ad ended up admitting that he had violated that warning, but that violation was unintentional, whatever that means. Uh, so the church had to convict him of something, right? They, he had violated this, this decree. The trial ended in kind of this out of court plea bargaining. And the result was that Galileo was forbidden to publish again and sentenced to a life of house arrest. He was also forced to kind of recite this kind of humiliating abjuration, retracting his, his beliefs. So this kind of arrogant, condescending Galileo was finally, finally humbled. But this conviction was, was, was upsetting. Not all the cardinals adjudicating the case uh, agreed with it. Uh, I think something like three out of the 10 refused to sign the, sign the sentence. So Galileo was never imprisoned and never tortured. He actually, for the rest of his life, spent uh, his Tuscan villa and died about a decade later. So the question is, does this information prove that science and religion naturally conflict? Again, the situation is complicated, right, by a number of different factors. On the one hand, there's this undeniable fact that Galileo was punished by the Catholic Church, okay? But the conflict began outside the church, right? And this kind of philosophical debate among natural philosophers about the nature of the moon and the planets. It was amplified by this kind of entanglement of church with complicated court politics, right? Uh, kind of political draft off, draft, uh, backdrop that we talked about. Um, so Galileo, for his part, never saw what he was doing as irreligious, right? He mustered religious arguments to defend both his method and his conclusions. And he believed right to the end of his life that he had been victimized, not by the church, 
but by a few vindictive men who manipulated right. the tools of the church to attack him. Um, so, and of I course, think, you add into that his own personality and oh, yeah. flaws. Yeah, when, when you when you write a book and the the Pope character is labeled the simpleton, that's not going <laughs> to yeah. go well in an official inquiry. Yeah, yeah but Galileo. Yeah. yeah, Galileo does say, you know, I do not feel obligated to believe the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. So th that was Galileo. Yeah, yeah. And I think he the has 30 his years more. He has his, I mean, I guess one of the problems is you, you, if you, if you, uh, even, you know, the Catholic Church, which oftentimes does get abstracted into sort of, you know, the, a corporate entity without any actual individual personalities within it. But, you know, there are, he's got his supporters uh, yeah. within the church as well who um, are on board. I, I wanted to ask this, though, um, uh, what was it like for Copernicus? Because Copernicus is almost a century prior, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you have a heliocentric model out there that people are aware of within the church uh, and in Europe. Um, what, how did it shake down for Copernicus? Nothing happened. He was fine. Nothing happened well, to him. So, was, so what? So, a different time. Maybe well, and what happen. I understand is a couple of things are going on. Um, by the part of the problem here is planets go retrograde, and how yeah. do you explain that? How do you, in other words, a planet is is traveling one way, one direction that we can see, and we can make charts on that. But every once in a while, it looks like it moves backwards a little bit. Right. This is an anomaly. This is kind of the Robert Kuhn paradigm shifting errata Thomas, Thomas, Thomas good sorry yeah uh the, the paradigm shifting errata that that you have to explain but those folks the philosophers the natural theologians they had actual created formulae to explain some of that stuff so so there were because they would go retrograde at kind of predictable intervals there was a scientific theory that could predict that, explain that, and it, it fit. And so though Copernicus does this, and, and, and I think I think you're right, James, there's there were questions and people didn't know all of the all of the um data yet because mm -hmm. the, the level of sophistication just hadn't been there. Yeah. But you move forward a hundred years, measurements are getting more refined, the errata becomes more problematic and now we've got to do something about it because it's it's really starting to fall apart so so between copernicus and galileo part of it is the fact that science is actually progressing and that science is progressing within the church itself I mean, you can yeah. you can think today of again i know you know talking with uh, stephen meyer from discovery institute last night you think about what's just going on among scientists right regardless of their religious beliefs right now on the issue of the neo-darwinian uh paradigm mm -hmm. and whether or not that's still tenable and this is a discussion amongst uh in the natural sciences amongst evolutionary theorists regardless of what what their religious beliefs are whether they're jews atheists christians muslims right i mean it's just so the same thing's going on in galileo's day you got these natural philosophers they're working off an aristotelian what i don't know would it be a ptolemaic uh, model yeah and the conflict's already there between them, and that's you can you can go to leave the religious beliefs aside. There's already conflict, right? You just go, you got one scientific model competing against another one. Um, so, yeah. Jay, how does? Think, yeah, go ahead. I think, I think I think another thing we should take in consideration, and this is this is this is uh, obviously uh, kind of the fault of the church. Um, the Catholic Church only at the time of the Galileo affair. Uh, affair, the Catholic Church only released the text of the Inquisition sentence, right? So the Inquisition sent copies of all, uh, mm -hmm. to all the other inquisitors requesting them to disseminate this kind of information. So the church wanted to make a lesson out of Galileo. Right. Uh, in that, they miscalculated. Yes. Because for over 200 years after the trial, the publicly available evidence seemed to indicate based on just reading the, the 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 sentence alone that there is various people have interpreted it as that the galileo was tortured in prison it wasn't until late into the 1700s 1800s that more details of the trial on the house arrest surface so the the subsequent stories of his arrest his imprisonment his torture 
like in part due to the church kind of hiding the details of the case. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, one of the reasons why I think Draper and White just kind of repeat this kind of simplistic narrative is because that's all they have, right? Uh, uh, I suppose. It, so we wouldn't uh, ascribe to them being just selective because of their assumptions. Everyone's selective, right? Yeah, I mean, they're selective, but Everyone, we wouldn't want to so, so no uh, make them more uh, more malevolent than, than. Yeah, I don't want I don't want to defend them, but I think I would respond in, in a couple of different ways. So it was. So this this kind of new evidence was kind of first appearing really in mid nineteenth century, and 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 it probably was very difficult for Americans to gain access to those documents. Um, unlike today, news of any new archival discovery happened quite slowly in the nineteenth century. Uh, second thing I would say is that what they did in their respective narratives is kind of rehash the myth of the Galileo affair from the previous four centuries. Um, uh, they, you know, you have anti-clerical poet John Milton, uh, mostly known for his Paradise Lost, but he also published a book opposing censorship. Uh, he actually lamented about Galileo's torture and imprisonment. And of course, you have the philosophes, you have Voltaire, but you also have uh, the English mathematician, scientist William Hewell and his great history of, the, of, of science also talking about Galileo being being uh, tortured in prison. And then in the early 20th century, you have Albert Einstein, you have philosopher Karl, uh, Karl uh, uh, Popper, Popper, all kind of kind of blasting the church for kind of torturing and imprisoning this kind of frail uh, Galileo. So, you know, they are culpable. Draper and White are culpable for spreading misinformation. But I just want to make sure that they, we, we don't, have them as the sole creators of of the myth. There, there uh, were others who were. Yeah, there were, there were a lot. And, uh, and interestingly enough, a lot of them were, were Protestant theologians and historians yeah. and, and thinkers. Well, it probably you know there's a uh, in literature uh, there, there's a uh, what, what's we used to call the Protestant um, the black legends uh, the black legend right uh, where the Protestants would in literature uh, would would paint, of course, the Catholic Church as dark and as yeah. uh, ignorant and barbaric as, as possible. And this is this kind of fit this fits in with that uh, unfortunate part. And this is another this is the other when I opened up with the Alul quote. This is, of course, the other error that he mentions we can't do is sort of whitewash the church's history either. Yeah. Um, and make it sound like, you know, um, there aren't uh, real uh, failures, you know, within the confines of the Catholic or the Protestant traditions. Yeah, and um, what, I, what, what I end up arguing in my work is that there's kind of a history of unintended consequences in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, what began as an anti-Catholic polemic by reformers, they started using history, they started using reason, they started using science or natural philosophy as a weapon against Catholic superstition and corruption became kind of a conflict actually between contending Protestant groups. You have the liberal Protestants and you have the conservative Protestants. Uh, And unfortunately, that kind of polemic uh, gets transferred over to those who uh, live outside of the church. And what you see by the end of the 19th century, beginning of the early 20th century, you see secularists, you see atheists, you see skeptics, taking this narrative from Draper and White and from other Protestant thinkers and applying it to all religions. Well, even to very context. recently with like when Neil deGrasse Tyson relaunched the Cosmos series and he opens up with, now this is not about, but the uh, Giordano, Bruno, Bruno yeah. which yeah. I'm sure is also in your book. Uh, I mean, I don't probably, right? No. Um, and I'm sure I didn't watch that series, but, you know, we, um, a lot of the new atheists, you know, this was part and parcel of their of their rhetoric was picking up, saying something about Galileo and the church. Yeah. So even up to very recently, um, I mean, this has still been uh, embedded in sort of the atheistic, materialistic um, sort of polemic, you know, against against, uh, you know, faith or Christ- Christianity specifically, I'd, I'd say. Yeah. So it just kind of makes me wonder about how we. As, as Christian thinkers, uh, theologians, historians, it makes me wonder how uh, 
we present our, our argument and present ourselves. I mean, to some extent, we can't really control how people take us out of context and, and kind of change the dialogue. Um, but it makes me, after doing my work, it makes me more aware of how important uh, my words uh, can, how, how easily my words can be misconstrued mm -hmm. and how uh, we have to be diligent and extremely careful of how we, we set up our, our arguments and our ideas. Um, because again, Draper and White, they thought they were, they were saving the church. Draper even, uh, White even says in his autobiography that he, he, he wrote his, his book because he wanted to save the church from itself. He wanted to save religion from itself. Um, but he didn't, right? People read his book and they used it to attack right. Christianity and all religion. So it's, 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 you know, I think both Draper and White would be shocked by what, what's happened to maybe more so white than than Draper, but kind of shock what how their their historical narratives have been kind of turned on its head to attack all religion and not yes. just the a particular Islam. kind. Yeah. General, right. God belief in general. Yeah. Well, this has been uh I mean I on that note then, um, you know, I just want to ask that, you know, as a historian, I mean uh, how I mean I, I always I tend to feel that, you know, theism christian theism more explicitly you kind of get at the at, at, in the at the level of or in the in the arena of of history and in historical studies mm. it gets attacked in two ways one they can get attacked by the sort of scientific crowd which seems to maybe be on the wane a little mm -hmm. bit currently since the new atheists have kind of evaporated but that attack was sort of like everything before you know, the Enlightenment, uh, everything before, you know, Galileo and everything was was pre-modern and barbaric and unscientific. And you get sort of the that conflict thesis that we just talked about. Yeah. Of course, the other the other side of that coin is more from the uh, the continental philosophers and the Marxists and so on, that everything that came before the 19th century is uh, is cruel and oppressive and regressive. You know, yeah. so you're getting this double attack and a lot of it revolves around a clear understanding of history. So as a historian, what would you say? What do you say to your students or people in the church about how do how do we be responsible? Kind of like what Alul was saying in the 80s, how do we be re responsible with our approach to the church's history? Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult because as I mean, one of the reasons why David Hutchings and I worked on Popes and Unicorns is we wanted to take this kind of more complex, difficult, challenging narrative in my first book, uh, or not just my book, but the kind of host of scholars for the last hundred years have been making about the conflict thesis, about the relationship between religion and science, and we wanted to popularize it. So we intentionally wrote it at a kind of a very accessible, kind of amusing level. Uh, that would attract kind of a more popular audience. And one of our intentions in the beginning when we started writing the book was that we wanted uh, younger readers to pick up a Popes, a Popes and Unicorn. It's, it's written for kind of a, a younger audience. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we found extremely challenging in doing that is that um, you, 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 you have to simplify. You have to simplify. Uh, and that obviously leads to the dangers that we kind of just talked about. I mean, the dangers of Draper and White is that they simplified a very complex history. And I think what, what with history, uh, as a historian, I think history is important. Uh, but I think it proves that we need to step kind of back from sweeping narratives of either conflict or concord, right? History shows that the concepts of science and religion are hard to nail down. You know, when is Aristotelian, this Aristotelian understanding of the moon and planets as perfect spheres, is that religious, a religious idea, or is that a scientific idea, right? Now, what do we mean by the words science and religion? 
right? So we need to be very clear about what science and religion actually are for authors like Draper and White and even the new atheists, right? How are they understanding those words? So you're not just doing historical research, but you're also doing, in a way, kind of deep philosophical, theological research. You're kind of localizing certain events. And that's why I think uh, biographical uh, history is so important. You know, for the last 100 years, right, historians of science have kind of picked Draper and White sort of as the whipping boys. You know, they're criticizing them. They're kind of repeating the same quote over and over again from their books. But then if you spend some time with them, doing biographical research, spending time in the archives, reading their personal correspondence, going through their journals, looking at everything they've published, seeing how their thoughts have kind of developed over time, uh, you have a better understanding of what they believe, right? And that's hard, right? It's hard yeah. to kind of simplify and popularize that kind of history. You know, I would just emphasize for, for, for people in the church, when they hear of, of, of conflict or when they hear people like Tyson or Dawkins or wherever, you know, kind of step away from being uh, overly critical. They do deserve criticism, but step away and try to understand what has led them kind of to believe this, right. to, to hold those positions. And I think, um, I, hopefully, more dialogue, more opportunities to dialogue. If we understand our kind of biographical history, where we're coming from, and you can you you can see that you can see that journey. I found it very helpful. Uh, another book that I found very uh, another thing that I found very helpful was um, uh, Richard Niebuhr. Richard Niebuhr published a book not too long ago about Christ and culture. So he has these 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 paradigms, these categories for how the church had kind of related itself to wider cultural themes and ideas, you know, Christ against culture, Tertullian, Christ, Christ right. for culture, Christ, uh, the transformer of culture, and so on. Looking at those categories, Niebuhr is not perfect, right? I, I, I think there's there's some criticism that we can give Niebuhr and how he how he conceptualized all these ideas, but understanding these things, there are uh, various ways that we can relate to wider culture, and like things like science. Um, and I'm I'm very fond of Saint Augustine, uh, who who argued that Christ is the sort of the transformer of culture, according to Niebuhr. And, and in that sense, you have you can use the things of science, you can use the things of wider culture, and and, and you can transform them in a way, kind of baptize them for for Christ. And and in that sense, all truth is ultimately uh, God's truth. But you have to be careful, right? You have to embrace these ideas or use these ideas, uh, not without a qualification and thinking deeply about them. Yeah. So it's kind of a, my, my own personal view, it's kind of a combination of looking at biographical history, history in general, philosophical understandings as well. Uh, and uh, again, one of the things that I try to emphasize in my own book is that this was not so much a conflict between religion and science, but ultimately a conflict between contending theological traditions. Right, right. And well, and we are we are big fans of Augustine here at the Kirkwood Center. So awesome. uh, we're always going to go with Augustine at the end of the day uh, when it comes to world conflicts. But that's um, that's great, Jay. And I, you know, and I think, too, the just the idea that especially in our day and age with so much information out there that people get inundated with, just always remember when it when, when you hear a, a historical about a historical event, a contentious one take a step back and realize it's going to be a lot more nuanced um, and a lot more complex than what is being presented to you, which at least then is the beginning of being able to think a little bit more critically uh, about some of these narratives that have been out there for a while. Um, Lenny, I, do you have anything to add? This has been a rich uh, episode here. Yeah. Um, well, I like even even as you say, the, the modern conflict that, uh, first of all, I think that would it be great that our churches taught the history of the church at all? <laughs> what that that might be that that, that, yeah. that that we could actually you know understand that there is a tradition to whom we can follow and build upon and 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 gain because most of the conflicts that we see in our society today were um, almost definitively answered some 1700 years ago 
or, or so. But uh, even today, you know, um, we were talking beforehand and, and, and James, you mentioned Paul Davies. And I, I just love mm -hmm. this, this quote that he says. He says, over the years, now he's an astrophysicist. So he's dealing with theoretical physics, uh, origin of the universe, things like that. Uh, but he makes the point, over the years, I've asked, often asked my physicist colleagues why the laws of physics are what they are. Mm -hmm. And the answer varies from, well, that's not a scientific question, which is what Dawkins would say, to nobody knows. Their favorite reply is, quote, there is no reason they are what they are. They just are. And he then summarizes it and says, the idea that the laws exist reasonlessly is deeply anti-rational. After all, the very essence of a scientific explanation of some phenomenon is that the worded world is ordered logically and that there are reasons things are as they are. If one traces these reasons all the way down to the bedrock of reality, that is the laws of physics, mm -hmm. only to find that reason then deserts us, it makes a mockery of science. So those fundamental questions are actually part of the discussion. Yeah. And uh, we are in Galileo's time. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the presuppositions, the, all, all those kinds of things. Uh, uh, so how do we explain that? And, and, and it shows that science and religion, just like everything else, you know, um, if we look at the transcendentals, right, you have goodness, truth, and beauty. As you follow them up to their ultimate endpoint, ultimate terminus, they all merge. What's good is beautiful and and if it's good and beautiful it's going to be true and i think that's the same thing with science and and faith as well it, all, all things will find their origin is god uh, with god and that's why they say theology is the queen of the sciences mm -hmm. that's right and we're sticking to that story no matter, <laughs> no matter what all right well james again thank you so much we will uh certainly uh link uh the books to the podcast we hope people will pick these books up and Dig into the history a little bit. It's a very important part of our apologetic and our and our evangelism, uh, especially these days. So thanks again for joining us on the Kirkwood Center podcast.